Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and the first topic today is Fitbits and all these wearable tracking devices, etc. Between 2010 and 2014, over 1.2 million Fitbit devices were sold. Today about 10% of American adults report owning some type of activity and biomarker tracker. There are various types of Fitbit trackers which monitor sleep patterns and heart rate and the number of steps taken, calories burned daily, and many other aspects of health and fitness. So with all the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent on these products, I think it's a fair question to ask if they're accurate and if they actually make a difference in health outcomes. Well, according to a new study, Fitbit trackers do not report heart rate accurately. The study was commissioned by a law firm which has filed a class action suit against Fitbit. The study found that Fitbit Blaze, Fitbit Charge HR, and Fitbit Surge, all of which use the Pure Pulse heart rate monitor, are um, highly inaccurate. The study was conducted by researchers, California State Poly researchers at California State Polytechnic University and involved evaluating 43 healthy adults during both rest and exercise. The heart rates were tracked during fit, uh, using Fitbit devices and also electrocardiogram, gram, and they got data for when they were resting and then also engaged in all different types of exercise, which included jumping rope, treadmills, outdoor jogging, and climbing. The Fitbit monitors were off by up to 20 beats per minute, particularly during intensive exercise. Now, representatives of Fitbit criticized the study design, said the researchers were biased, but this isn't the only study that has shown this same result. Researchers at Ball State University, in conjunction with an NBC-affiliated television station, reported that Fitbit Charge HR had an error rate of 14%. The study authors stated that calculations are often off by 20 to 30 beats per minute, and this can be dangerous for people at high risk of heart disease. Fitbit issued a written statement to the television station claiming that the company's products, quote, are designed to provide meaningful data to our users to help them reach their health and fitness goals and are not intended to be scientific or medical devices. Well, maybe a disclaimer on the product itself would be appropriate. The accuracy of measuring a Fitbit for measuring other things has been called into question as well. A 2011 study looked at the accuracy of Fitbit for reporting data on sleep and showed that Fitbit overestimated how much time adults were asleep by 67 minutes, and for children it was 109 minutes. Sleep researchers have commented that this is not surprising because trackers like Fitbit detect movement and sleep patterns are really measured more in terms of brain waves and um, that's not commonly picked up by a Fitbit type tracker. As for overall efficacy of Fitbit and wearable devices, do they actually result in better health outcomes? Well, studies have mainly focused on people who are sick and they generally show a positive result. So Fitbits are appropriate for some things. Recovery of mobility after surgery improved as a result of wearing a tracker. And both the length of hospitalization and health status of dis at discharge were better for elderly adults um, and cardiac patients who used a tracking device. But so far, studies have not shown um, benefits for patients with chronic, diabetes, chronic diseases like diabetes or COPD. Some studies have shown a short-term increase in activity and weight loss as a result of wearing the monitoring devices, but there really isn't any evidence currently, at least, showing that the results are sustained over a long period of time. Now, I want to be fair to Fitbit and wearable devices here. The reality is that almost all short-term efforts at increased activity, better eating, weight loss, they're almost all successful in the short term. And it may be that wearable devices are just part of the whole trend that people do really well with something for a while and then the effect wears off. In fact, studies show that um, these uh, trackers like Fitbit um, do tend to follow that trend. Uh, about one third of people who use wearable devices report that they stop using them within six months of use, of starting to use. I don't spend a lot of time talking people out of using this, these devices, um, and, and one of the reasons is I think they do have some value in terms of making people more aware and conscious of what's going on every day, and that's the beginning of making changes is when people start to think about their health on a daily basis. So I think there's some benefit to them from this perspective. Um, so, but, you know, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking somebody out of it. By the same token, I don't spend a lot of time telling people you ought to go get one of these things and wear it. I think it's a little bit better to spend time on things like making sure people start down the path of adopting a better diet, a better exercise program, 
and other strategies that are needed to achieve and maintain optimal health. So I think that, um, I guess my, my closing comments about Fitbit is I think that for people who have um, clearly diagnosed some problems, for example, mobility issues, they can be helpful. I think from the standpoint of bringing more awareness to a person's um, uh, mind every day that they should be paying attention to their health, they're valuable. And I'm sure out of all the millions of Fitbit users and people who wear these things, I'm sure there's some people out there who can report this has made a difference in my life and those people, um, they should keep using them. But uh, as an overall strategy, I think we just don't have enough evidence to, or any evidence at this point to say go, everybody should wear one of these things. It makes life better, it improves habits, it leads to a guaranteed result. All right, now the next thing I'm going to talk about, I'm really happy to report this to you. According to a new study, sales of the most commonly prescribed drugs used to treat osteoporosis dropped by 50% during, during the time period between 2008 and 2012. The authors say that the reason is media reports detailing the side effects of the drugs have caused, quote, an important shift in patient behavior. Yay for the media. You don't find me giving kudos to the media very often. Um, the news gets better. This particular study addressed only oral bisphosphonates, but other research studies show that there have been similar declines in intravenous versions of the drugs too. In other words, here's what's going on. What I've dreamed about for my whole career. Consumers are playing a more active role in healthcare decisions. They're seeking information on their own, and they're feeling more confident about saying no to healthcare practitioners who give them recommendations that they don't think are in their best interest. The researchers noted, by the way, that the media can't be held entirely responsible for this because bone experts have been advising that the length of time patients stay on the drug should be limited even before the media started publicizing risks associated with taking them. So the authors note that their study confirms the association between bisphosphonate drugs and increased risk of femur uh, fractures, fractures of the thigh bone. Fractures increased during the entire time the drug prescriptions were increasing and there were similar drops as the use of the drugs went down. The um, incidence of, um, of femur fractures went down as well, continues to go down today. Um, the only disappointing part of this article, from my perspective, was the suggestion that doctors and researchers need to do a better job of, quote, disseminating and translating our message to the community at large. Now, let me tell you what that means in medical speak. It means doing a better job of selling drug treatment to patients. Disease organizations agree that doctors need to be better salesmen. The American Society for Bone and Mineral Research, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and the National Bone Health Alliance have issued a statement encouraging <coughs> doctors to become more aggressive in pushing bisphosphonate drugs to their patients. But according to Dr. Paul Miller, medical director at the Colorado Center for Bone Research, more aggressive selling is not likely to work. He says, quote, 90% of patients, when you talk to them about starting one of these drugs, won't go on. He also says that 90% of those who are on the drugs want to quit. In fact, half the people who take these drugs quit within a year, and even those who have had a hip fracture are increasingly saying no to a prescription. In 2011, only 20% of patients who were hospitalized with a broken hip agreed to take the drugs when they left the hospital. So apparently it's getting harder to scare even people who've had a fracture into taking these drugs. The refusal may not be just due to media, as the researchers um, referenced earlier, um, and it may not be just because of femur fractures and osteonecrisis of the jaw, but also lawsuits that have resulted in large awards, and the FDA has changed its recommendations. Um, they issued a statement, the agency issued a statement in 2010 requiring that the increased risk of atypical fractures be added to the warnings and precautions section of the label and that the indications and usage section state that it's unknown how long the drugs need to be taken in order to treat or prevent osteoporosis. The FDA's website also indicated other concerns about the drugs, which included kidney impairment, increased risk of esophageal cancer, and severe pain. And in fact, I mentioned earlier that half of the people taking these drugs go off within a year. That's uh, because of the serious side effects. Um, People hate the side effects. That's why drug companies develop the intravenous and four times a year uh, drug treatments because the compliance on the oral bisphosphonate uh, drugs was, was just awful. 
Well, at Wellness Form Health, it's our mission to help patients to make more informed decisions about care. I think this is a marvelous development, indicating that more patients are developing a healthy skepticism about healthcare recommendations. And, and by the way, I don't want people to turn into cynics, but based on how much misrepresentation goes on in the healthcare business every single day, it really is a good thing to develop a healthy skepticism. And I just hope that this whole movement continues to gain momentum. All right, well, that's all for today and all for the week. As always, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you next week with more news.